just in case there's a few others need to gather in. We'll sing another couple of verses. We'll sing the first verse and the third verse again. The first and the third. And then we will have an uh, opening prayer by the Reverend Greer. Verses 1 and 3. Let's lift our praise unto the Lord, please. Well, I'm glad you found a seat. Uh, when you sat down again, somebody else hadn't taken it. It's great to see you all gathered here this evening. Uh, we're now going to bow together and let us unite our hearts in prayer as we come to the Lord and we seek Him for the help that we need on this very blessed night when the Reverend Martin will soon come to stand behind the pulpit here and bring testimony. But let's all bow together, let's bow reverently and with that due and godly fear before the great God of heaven, before the throne of heavenly grace, and let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let's all seek the Lord. Our eternal God and our gracious Father in heaven, we wait in thy presence and we draw near to thee now in the name of thy Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for the reminder in this hymn of that grace that saves the soul, that grace that brings men nigh to God, into fellowship with God out of the darkness of their sin, out of their fallen state, and reconciles them to the Father in heaven, and gives them a standing that is perfect in His sight. We thank Thee for the One who is the very embodiment of that grace, our Lord Jesus Christ. We think of how Paul could speak to Titus of that time when the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared unto all men. And Lord, how we thank Thee for that coming of the Savior into the world in the fullness of time. We bless Thee for His person and His work and for all that He is, all that He has done. We rejoice, O Lord, that He has finished the work the Father gave Him to do. He has fulfilled the law. He has honored it in every part. That law that we as fallen men and women have broken, and have broken time without number, and have done so in thought, word, and deed. We rejoice, O Lord, that Christ came, and to that law he gave a full and a perfect obedience. And thou didst say over him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we rejoice, O Lord, that he went to the cross then, as he came to that, po that point, that moment, in his earthly journey, and there he died for guilty sinners such as we who are gathered here tonight. Lord, we confess our unworthiness and our sin. Confess, O God, that we deserve nothing from thee but thy wrath and thy curse forever. And Lord, if thou didst do justly unto all men, then every one of us would sink into the lowest hell and be under the condemnation of God forever. But how we thank Thee for the grace of which we have been singing. We think of how Paul wrote to the Ephesians, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We thank Thee, O Lord, for the Saviour who is the covenant head of sinners who trust Him, and who has procured for them the very faith that they need to believe in Him, and to rest in Him, and to repent of their sins. And Lord, we pray this evening hour that 
Thou wilt draw near to us as we meet here in the name of thy Son. And as this meeting takes its course, we thank thee for this mission. We thank thee for these three weeks in which thy word has been proclaimed and thy servant has ministered faithfully and powerfully under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God and has brought the glorious news of salvation evening by evening. And we rejoice, O Lord, that thou hast been here, thou hast been one of our number. Lord, there hasn't been a meeting when God was not present. There hasn't been a time when we did not feel thy power and know thy nearness. Lord, we come to give thee the glory and the praise. We thank thee, O Lord, for working in hearts and for using thy word and for bringing glory to our Saviour's name thereby. And yet, Lord, we're at a moment now that is new to us, a time, Lord, in which we gather together, and we will never gather in this manner again. And, Lord, we need thee to come, and we need thee, Lord, to visit us tonight in a very real and powerful way, even by the Spirit of the living God. We thank thee that we come to the triune God of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless thee for the one who is sent forth by the Father and the Son to apply redemption unto souls. Lord, that's our prayer, that as thy servant brings his own personal story of how God met him and saved him and tells of Christ and all his grace and power to save, that all of this will be brought home to heart savingly. O oh Lord, we pray for the many gathered here tonight in this house. Lord, thou dost know every heart. We are but mortal men. We cannot see beyond the exterior. We cannot see the heart, and yet we come to the one who searches the heart and who brings home to the soul the truths of the gospel in that manner that only he is able to do. And Lord, we pray therefore for the moving and the working of the Holy Spirit of God in this house and among this gathered people. O oh Lord, may there be conviction of sin as thy servant speaks of how thou didst rescue him from his sin. May the sense of sin come over this gathering. May the awareness of guilt and condemnation grip hearts and minds in a way that they have never felt it before. We pray, O Lord, that they will also be brought to Calvary to see that there's a remedy for sin. We thank the Lord for the remedy that our brother Mr. Martin experienced when God awoke him by free grace from on high and his mind was enlightened and there was an application to his heart of all the merits on and all the saving value of the blood of the everlasting covenant. And he was made a new man. He, he became a new creature. Thou didst take him and not only save him, but thou didst indwell him by the Spirit. And thou didst take him on with thee, Lord, in his early days as a Christian. And on from then into the work of the gospel ministry. And we thank thee for what thou hast done through him, down through these past years in his ministry in Lisburn. And we thank the Lord for all the missions that he's conducted across our land. And we bless thee, O Lord, for the fruit that thou hast given him. And when, Lord, we rejoice in all this tonight. And we pray that here this evening thou wilt do the same. Thou wilt give fruit that will remain. And, Lord, we pray that a work will be done. And thou wilt visit us in power and with great glory. Lord, come now. Abide with us, we pray. Shelter us beneath the shadow of thy wing. Take away every disturbance. Take away every wandering thought from our minds. Shut us in with thee. O Lord, a clamoring world wants our attention, wants to distract us, wants to cause some kind of annoyance or obstacle. And Lord, we pray against that. We pray against the old enemy. We're hearing about him the other night. Yea, Lord, many nights in this mission. The enemy of the soul, the one who comes to to kill and to destroy and to bring sinners down to eternal ruin. And, O oh Lord, we pray that all the ploys and schemes of the powers of darkness will be overcome, and this meeting will have the note of victory within it. And may Christ be magnified. Hear us, we pray. Abide with us now, O oh God, and grant thy blessing and thy power as we continue on with thee. For this we ask in our Saviour's name and for his glory and for his everlasting praise. Amen and amen. I'm sure most of you know that we have been having a, a three-week gospel mission here in this, uh, this place, this meeting house, 
Some of the meetings were over the way in the church hall, and, and now we've come here to meet for the last part of the mission, and obviously it is good that we moved across, otherwise we'd be in serious trouble trying to get you into uh, the hall across the road. But anyhow, I want now to just take a moment and welcome you very heartily to this particular meeting. It's special in nature, it is a testimony meeting, when the evangelist, the Reverend Martin, will tell his own word of testimony and bring to you the story of his own conversion. And we're glad you're here tonight to, to listen to what the Lord's servant will deliver as he speaks tonight. And so I want to welcome you. Many, many people are here for the first time. Many are here from different parts of the province, I believe, never mind the Bellamina area. And we're glad to welcome everyone, and we thank you for coming, and we pray that the power and the blessing of God you will feel in your soul. And perhaps this may be the first time in your life when you've been in a meeting like this, and you wonder what it's all about and what you're going to hear. Well, while there will be a testimony, yet our chief objective is that you will come to know Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our prayer. And therefore, may the Lord come down and visit hearts in this meeting. And where you sit in your seat now, may you feel the power of God gripping your soul and conviction of sin coming over your mind and heart and that awareness of your need, your great and deep need to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be ready to meet God at that great day when the Savior will come again. And so think about that tonight. We welcome as well our webcast viewers. We thank you for tuning in again, and we give you a very hearty welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just a few announcements here I wish to make. Uh, again, we want to say that there are CD and DVD recordings of all the meetings, and if you can get out that way, you'll find them on the table in the entrance hall there. And if you can't get out there, we'll then just tell some of the men, and we'll try to get uh, some of these for you. But that may be difficult tonight, but all the meetings are recorded, and there are some available in those two formats, DVD and CD, so pick some up as you leave. The mission concludes on Sunday evening, in the will of the Lord, uh, 6.30, and Mr. Martin will be back again to bring the closing message of the mission. And we certainly would invite you to come on Sunday evening and join with us as we meet here in the Lord's house on that occasion. We look forward to it. We want to come to a, a high peak again in the mission as it closes, and therefore you come and join with us on Sunday night at 6.30 in the evening. If you're from the Balmina area and you're not a church attender and you'd like to come in the morning as well, you'll be very welcome. 11.30 in the morning during this mission I have been uh, preaching messages that have been, I feel, given to me by God, and that's a testimony of the Lord's people, and they are really messages that have been supportive of the whole concept of evangelism, and especially the, the idea of a local moving of God in awakening and, and in revival. And I'll be coming back to that on Sunday morning, and so you're warmly invited to come, if you will, uh, if you'd care to do so, to the meeting at 11.30, and then the mission service, 6.30, in the evening, you're all warmly invited. One other little announcement here. We have the friends from Lisbon who came by bus. And the driver said to me, if I just could say this, the easiest way for you to get on that bus is go out this way across the car park, is out at the side gate. Uh, rather than him trying to get the bus maneuvered into the car park, the bus will be across there. And uh, that will be easier for him, and I feel easier for you. Uh, trying to get onto the bus back to Lisburn. So please take note of that, Lisburn people. We're very glad to have people from Lisburn and from other uh, churches of our denomination and, of course, other people from other backgrounds as well, other churches or whatever, uh, fellowships. We're very glad to see you here, and we uh, trust the Lord will bless you all tonight. Now, the session committee always like to uh, encourage the preacher by giving him a love offering. And we're going to do that now, tonight. At this point, we're going to take up an offering. Now, if you haven't come prepared to give anything to the offering, don't worry about that. Just let the plate go on by you. Uh, but those who wish to give to the offering, that will be taken up now. So please keep that in mind. It is for the Reverend Martin to show our appreciation to him of his labors among us 
in these days. And so uh, our brother, our assistant, Mr. Andrew Stewart, is going to come now and give out the hymn and lead you in that offering hymn. And the number is 371, another testimony hymn, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. 371 is found on the page 326 and will remain seated for... Well, it could be the whole, all of this hymn, and we'll have to sing another few verses, but 371 remain seated uh, as the stewards wait for the offering, please. We'll make it our final verse, and that will give the Reverend Martin plenty of time to bring that personal word of testimony. Verse 2, making it our last verse, rising to change your positions, please. good singing and let's uh, come now to the time when the Reverend Martin will testify. I want to give him a very hearty word of welcome once again. I've personally enjoyed fellowship with him and his ministry here and we're going to hand over to him now and he will come and bring the word of the Lord. 
Thanks, Andrew. Folks, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to turn, please, in the Word of God to the Psalm number 34. The 34th Psalm, it's a testimony of David. And I know it's been billed as the Reverend Martin sharing his testimony, but I just want to make it clear that uh, it's the testimony of Christ. It's really what the Lord has done for my soul. I came out of prison in 1988, and the Lord spoke to my heart. I asked the Lord, what will he have me to do? And I got a clear word from God in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and the verse 19. I did preach on the conversion of the demoniac of Gadara just the other night, but it was those words of Christ uh, to that man who wanted to do something for the Lord. And Christ said to that man, go home to thy friends and tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee and how he has had compassion on thee. And so every opportunity I get, no matter where it is, whether in a, a church building, in a hall, in an assembly, in school, or anywhere, I would take the opportunity and do what the Lord told me to do, and that is to go home and tell thy friends what great things the Lord hath done for thee, and how he has had compassion on thee. And like the Apostle Paul, while I will share something I know of my past tonight, of which I am ashamed, I have to confess that. I can't rewrite history. I can't change what happened in my life. I would like to be able to do that, but it is not possible. And so, by the grace of God, I want to glory in the cross tonight. I want to tell you about one who reached down in the Mays prison in Lisburn and saved my precious soul and brought me to know him who loved me and gave himself for me. We do need to take time, therefore, to read the Word of God and to share with you something of the testimony of the Lord and the grace of God and His keeping power in my own life. And it is no secret, I believe, what the Lord can do and what He has done for others, He can do for you. He can save you tonight. He can rescue you. He can deliver you from your sin. And He can bring you to that place of repentance and faith in Christ whereby you will receive Christ as your Savior and you will go away from this house tonight rejoicing in sins forgiven and peace with God and knowing that it is well, it is well with your soul. Psalm 34 then in the verse 1, let us all hear the word of the Lord. The psalmist David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord, that's Christ, the messenger of the covenant. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are, O oh, the happinesses of the man that trusteth in him. We we'll end our reading there at the verse 8. The Lord will bless, I believe, this brief but public reading from his own precious and infallible word. Like the psalmist David, I can say, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Just before I share with you a personal word of testimony, could we take another moment and just bow briefly before the Lord in prayer and ask help of God in the hearing? And for me, as I share with you something of the Lord's grace and mercy in my own heart and life. Let us all pray. Gracious God and eternal loving Heavenly Father, it is with a thankful and a grateful heart that I enter into thy courts and give thee thanks for thy saving and keeping power. I thank thee, O God, for all those years ago when thou didst reach down thy hand in love and mercy and save my precious never-dying soul. I thank thee, O God, for the blood that cleansed away my sin, 
I thank thee for that finished work at Calvary that gives me peace with God. I stand in the righteousness of Christ. I bless thee, O God, for one who is my mediator, my redeemer. And I thank thee, O God, that thou hast given to me uh, that experience of the new birth, rescued me, O God, from falling into the very sides of the pit that has delivered me from the lowest hell. I thank thee for what thou hast done for many in this meeting house tonight. And I pray, O God, that thy spirit will fall. Bring conviction for sin. Bring sinners, O God, we pray, to that place where they will acknowledge that sin. They will confess, separate from it, repent of it, and turn by faith alone to Christ and receive him by faith into their heart and life as their own and personal Savior. And Almighty God, I stand publicly publicly now before thee. I'm conscious, O God, I'm not just before man, but before thee, Almighty God. And in thy holy presence, on the merit of the shed blood of the Lamb, in the high and holy and mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, I ask for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I stand, O God, where I have stood on many evenings in this house and this hall, and I've asked thee publicly for the infilling of the Spirit, Thou hast been faithful, giving to me help, and I look to thee again. I cast myself on thee and pray, Father, that thou wouldst give to me that anointing, that unction from on high, and the infilling of thy Spirit, whereby I will be enabled to make much of Christ, to glorify his name, to bring honor and glory to the man of Calvary. And, Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost, restore the backslider, Revive thy church, and Father, glorify thy dear Son, and the people of God said, Amen. You know, I never had the privilege of being brought up in a Christian home. What I mean by that, I didn't have any of my parents who were born again and saved by God's matchless grace. In fact, my home was a very dysfunctional home. What I mean by that is both my mum and dad were not only unsaved, but they were both alcoholics. And from my earliest memory, I can remember my mum and dad bringing alcohol into our home. Uh, my father pressed alcohol to my lips from I was a child of three. I was born in England. It's hard to believe when you hear this accent now. Uh, I was born in Nottingham. And I remember in those early days being in the living room. There were men and others in drinking with my father. And he filled the little cap off the beer bottle. I remember him pressing it to my lips, laughing, and then taking more and more until I literally started to stagger in that living room. And some of the men in that room, out of embarrassment, said to my dad, Tommy, that's enough. It's not right what you're doing. I cannot imagine that I as a parent would introduce my child to alcohol. After what I have seen it has done to me and my family and my school friends and many other people that I have worked with, and then to think that at the age of three I was introduced to alcohol. It just is hard to believe that that actually happened, but I'm standing before God, I'm telling you the truth. It's a very dysfunctional home. My mum and dad never got on too well. They were always arguing and fighting. And we were in the midst of it all. Sometimes we had to take uh, the brunt of my father's anger. He was a very uh, good man whenever he was sober. But whenever my dad was full drunk, he was a drunken, violent man at times. And both my body and the body of my two brothers bore the marks of my father's cruelty. Uh, my father somehow took custody of his three boys. My eldest brother, Colin, uh, who has passed away a year and a half ago, and my youngest brother, David, who I just see in the meeting here in front of me, and myself. Uh, we were brought back from England to Northern Ireland to a little farm. Now, I've told you all week that I'm a townie, and I am. I should be ashamed to say that. I know that, especially in front of all you country folk. But I was brought up for a little time on a farm. I had no interest in farming because all I ever did was kick football on the farmyard and chase the chickens around with a bow and arrow. And... Uh, <laughs> Many other things, but I can't mention them from the pulpit here tonight. But I will say this, that those early days weren't too bad. We were marched off to the local primary school. Now, like many young people in my generation, uh, the teacher had said to me, well, Thomas, how do you like school? I says, I like it closed. And that's a fact. <laughs> and, then, and to be politically correct in my day and generation, I like it semtext. And that my school was actually blown up, but I didn't do it. I promise you, I did not do it. 
although it may have been in my mind, but I definitely didn't do it. Uh, the Republicans blew my primary school up and uh, they tried to kill the headmaster and others who were involved in politics and was a justice of the peace and so on. And uh, where we lived and we were moving to a little country place, there was a little country school and it wasn't too bad. We had a mile to walk to school. And uh, I know my brother David's here, he'll remember this, but uh, my granda bought us hognail boots. It's like a Clydesdale horse coming up the road, I'm telling you. And we marched up that tarmac road, and you heard the three Martins coming half a mile away. And then when I was going up to school, I loved to throw stones. Any wonder I got into trouble? And I dug them out of the turf and the peat, and my hands were black. My nails, you couldn't get the dirt out of them. But what they had in school, and I never learnt my lesson, they had what is known as a hand inspection. So when you arrived in the primary school, you stood in a line. And no matter what I did, no matter, I could not get the dirt out of those hands. And if your hands were dirty, you got the cane. And it was sore, believe me. It's like a little boy standing in the queue and he puts his hand out. And the teacher says, if you can show me a dirtier hand than that one, I'd not cane you. So he put the other one out. Well, that's exactly what I could do. I could have done the same. But you know, life for me in primary school, it wasn't too bad at, at primary school. My father, well, we moved away from my grandparents' house. We thought that would be a good move, that my father would get some independency. We get the three boys reared now without the influence of the grandparents, my granny and my granda. So we moved to a nearby town called Lurgan. We thought things would pick up there, but they didn't. Really, my father just picked up where he left off. For he was originally from Belfast. He joined the army. Uh, he told us that he was in the Royal Engineers and all this here, but we actually heard he was only part-time and he didn't really do a big lot. I think he was in what is known as the SAS. He only worked Saturday and Sunday, and I think that was all. But it, you know when your father tells you everything, you believe it. My boys believed everything about me. He was a superhero until they became teenagers and they realized what a wimp my dad really is. But I want to say this to you. Uh, my dad, he, he tried his best to rear those three boys. And I have to say this. I really, we were hard work. I have to say that. And I know some of the neighbors that are still alive today, they will tell you that the three Martin boys were extremely hard work. We were on the top of their roofs, walking across the, the, the very ledges of their roof, climbing round their chimneys. We were even in derelict houses beside them, and we were knocking holes through into their attics and going through. Uh, there was so much we were up to. And when you look back at it all and you just wonder, you wonder how social workers ever kept us in that house. But it was the mercy and grace of God because the Lord had a wonderful plan for my home and for our house. A wonderful plan. And I want to tell you very shortly about that wonderful plan that God had for my dad and for his three boys. But I want to say this, that uh, whenever my father was sober, he was a good man, and he tried his best. But whenever he was drunk, I feared my dad. And I knew that when he was coming home from the pub, things were going to get bad. But you know, he brought a lot of people with him. He wasn't content to drink on a Thursday night because he came in from work with a wage packet on a Thursday evening. My dad headed off to the pub straight away. And I did not, and David will, will verify this, there were some times we did not see our father until the early hours of Monday morning. I was delegated by the two brothers to go on what is known as a pub crawl. That is, I frequented the public houses in Lurgan. I stood outside the door. That was the time whenever, under law, all public houses must have obscure glass. There was never a public house in my day under the law in this country that was allowed clear glass. And furthermore, even on the brightest day, the lights were always on in a public house. That tells me the darkness of that place. My father would have brought me from, I was a young boy along with my two brothers, David and Colin, and he would have brought us to pubs and he kept us all day in pubs. We sat all day in pubs. He put us in what is known as a little snug. And you sat there. You could maybe see part of the television it was a smoke-filled pub and the smell of the beer mats and the drink and the carpet and men coming in to see if we're all right. They would have thrown in maybe a bottle of Fanta or a bottle of Coke and then some packets of crisps and we just sat there all day, all day, right until my father could hardly walk and then he brought us home and then he brought everybody else with him and our house was just a halfway house for any person who wanted to drink and who wanted to gamble and there's many a night before uh, we were 
in bed. We never slept. We got up in the morning, and some men were still lying on the settee. Some had fallen across our bed at night, and we were literally shoved into the corner. Uh, we sometimes slept in the one bed. Sometimes we, maybe two of us were in one bed, and I used to joke whenever we never had any duvet, we never had any fancy bed clothes. Uh, we used to say to my dad, Dad, I've just pulled the sleeve out of the good duvet because it was just an overcoat thrown over the top of us, and that's all we had. Uh, I tell you this fact. Uh, one of the rooms that I slept in, it had no glass in the window. Now, that's a fact. No glass in the window. And I put my pillow beside it, and I lay, and I watched the moonlight and everything. I listened to the birds at six in the morning. And, I, and when I was there, my mates called for me during the summer, those beautiful summer days. And they literally came onto our kitchen roof, reached in through the pane with no glass in it, and then tapped me on the head. That's why I'm bald like this, by the way. And then asked me, are you coming out? And I just rose out of that bed because I slept in my clothes. And I just went straight out, no breakfast, because I'm telling you, there was no food in my house. There was nothing. Because my father spent every penny that he had on alcohol. Every penny. He never clothed us, and he very rarely fed us. And we lived because the neighbors gave us Vita bread and cheese. And boy, do I hate Vita bread and cheese now, <laughs> let me tell you. But I will say this to you, that my father was a good man at times, but he was struggling with alcohol. And as a result of that, my friends, whenever we got out, we seemed to be oblivious. They always talked about us. But when we went to school, they called us names, and we got into a lot of trouble. We were outside the headmaster's office so many times. Uh, we, we can't really uh, recall how many times we stood outside the headmaster's office. Other times we got into big trouble. And then there were times we just never bothered going to school at all because my father went off to work. We were left to ourselves. We were meant to be there, if you understand what I mean. And uh, we just spent the day in a derelict building and just wasted the day. We never even bothered going to school. Uh, but you know, my father's drinking became worse. But the Lord began to work in our home in a remarkable way, in a very small way, just the way some folks have been working in your home over this past while. There was this lady called Elsie, an individual who knew and she loved the Lord. She was a saved lady. And she had an interest in our family, and not only because we were in poverty, and I mean abject poverty, not only because we were destitute of the basic necessities of life, and she was there as a practical uh, Christian doing something for us, a very kind lady. But it was remarkable. She had a tremendous influence over my dad. She worked with him in the local factory, but she had a real boldness for the Lord. And she came into our home, and I know, and I don't uh, say anything about Christians or anything when I was young. Uh, you would not have bothered with the Martin household. I know it was very uncomfortable to have us around. Uh, and if you were trying to work with us, a lot of the society had really abandoned us. But I can understand that, but Elsie didn't. And she said to my dad one time, would you not come out to church with me, Tommy? And my dad said, Elsie, I know that I'll not be able to make it because he was drinking on a Thursday night right through to Monday morning. He was in no fit state to go to church. But he hit on this idea that the more Elsie asked him to go to church, the more he would make his three boys go to church. So when Elsie comes round and says, Tommy, would you come out to church? My dad would have said, no, Elsie, but I know the boys would love to go to church. <laughs> what? Love to go. I'm surprised my ears are this size because he dragged me out to church. And we didn't have any clues. So what happened was we had a room. Now, this is a fact. I'm telling you this before Almighty God. There's no exaggeration here, even though my father told me, I've told you a million times not to exaggerate, but I'm not exaggerating. There was a room in our house and had no floorboards, none whatsoever. You never went into that room and you'd appreciate. All it had was brick joists at the bottom. But there was another room and it had some floorboards. And inside that room was at least three feet of clothes. The local charity shops, the Spina Bifida shop especially, they kept all the children's clothes and they sent them round to the Martin household. And there's times I sat in the middle of those clothes and I tried on. I didn't even know there was small, medium or large. Whatever fitted me, there was no color scheme. I never forget the day that I walked into Carrick School and I walked into the classroom and I got what is known as the wow factor. I had on a pair of shorts with every color. It was gray, yellow, red, purple. A pair of shorts, it could have been winter. I had on a brown, a really dark, filthy brown t-shirt with a bright yellow tank top. Looked like a canary. 
And when I walked into that room, I got this, wow. And I thought it was, wow, look at him. It was, wow, look at that. That's what it was. But I was totally oblivious. And that's how we were dressed. So we were able to get something out of that room, pick up something that would be decent, and out to church we went. And my dad refused to go. Elsie kept at my father, kept at him, and said, would you not come? And then she hit on the idea, we'll get the boys involved in the church, and then that'll bring Tommy Martin to the church. And that is a good way to evangelize, by the way, because when you get the little lambs, then the big sheep will come and they will follow. And how true that is. And so Elsie, in her wisdom, well, she got us involved more and more in church. And she came around one time, she said to my dad, do you think, Tommy, the boys would like to come to the Sunday school. So my dad said, yes, I'll say, they would love to go to Sunday school. So off we went on a Sunday morning. And we also were hijacked, and I'm using this term lightly, we were hijacked as well by the free peas. They got us in the afternoon. So we were well versed in the gospel. We headed off to, that, to the Sunday school. And then Elsie came back again. She says, Tommy, on a, on a Thursday evening, uh, there is a, a boys' brigade. Would the boys like to come to the boys' brigade? And my dad said, yes, I'll say, they would love to go to the boys' brigade. Then she came back again, and she says, Tommy, would the boys like to go on a Friday night to the youth club? And I thought, Sunday morning, Sunday school, church, the free peace had us in the afternoon. Then on Thursday night was the boys' brigade. Now Friday night is the youth club, church, 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 and I don't want to go. And uh, Elsie came back again. She wasn't finished. And she says, Tommy, on a, on a Monday evening, we're starting confirmation classes in the church. Would your boys like to be confirmed? And I thought, please, Dad, not confirmation. And my dad said, yes, Elsie, they would love to be confirmed. And off we went to confirmation for these 13 weeks of classes. And then a bishop laid hands on your head. And look what happened to me. <laughs> now nah, I'm only joking. And then all of a sudden she came back. Now, this was the worst of all. She came with this tape recorder. And it was a massive thing. It was like a breeze block. They've all, now technology's moved on. They're all small gadgets now. But this was massive. And there were times we had electric and there were times we didn't. I remember a knock came to the door one time and this man was in the Northern Iron boiler suit. And he said to me, is your daddy in, son? And I says, no, he's in the factory next door working. And he says, well, I have bad news for you. He says, your father hasn't paid his electric bill. I could have told him that. And he hadn't paid his rent neither. And he didn't pay for the rental TV. He pays for nothing. So that's not news to me. In fact, I read all his bills. I can tell you exactly what he owes you. I can tell you all the letters you've written to him. And I've told, I've even, even the, the, the little scheme you were looking him to work with and he won't work with you. He says, well, I've bad news for you. I'm here to cut your electric off. And so I let him in. And he snipped the wires and the meter stopped working. My dad came in from church. They rolled Bakelite switches and he switched all the lights on. And he shouted right around the house. He says, what's wrong with these lights? And I shouted back, you didn't pay your electric bill and the man's cut the electric off. And he shouted at me, did you let him in? I says, I did. And he was going to kill me for letting him in, but he didn't pay the bill. I mentioned that because I was in a meeting one time and I said that. And this man met me because in the Windsor Bar, my dad went up and, and was telling him a sad story. The boys, are, they have no heat, the electric's off. Well, we had a cold fire and they can't cook. Well, we had a gas cooker. And he says, and there's no light. Well, we were out at 11 o'clock at night, so it didn't matter. So this man unofficially came down from the electric board, and he put our lights back on again. And he joined the wires up, and the electric board didn't know that 10 James Street was up and running. It's like Blackpool Illuminations. <laughs> and I remember giving that my testimony and mentioning that. And this man met me at the door. And you know what he said to me? He says, son, do you know who I am? And I had a good look at him. And he's still alive today, so I can't mention his name, for he was never done for that, by the way. <laughs> And he says, I do know who you are. You're the man that put our electric on. The good job it wasn't the guy that cut it off, let me tell you. <laughs> and here's what he said to me. He said, son, I just want to let you know that I have come to Christ and I've been saved. My life's completely changed. I remember going into your house and you three boys up in that bedroom and us drinking the bed out. I, I listened to your testimony tonight and I was there the whole time. And everything you have said, son, is absolutely true. For I was there. All those card schools, all the heavy drinking sessions, the time when people came round and destroyed our house, wrecked it, broke all the windows. And we were all sitting there in fear. But Elsie came round with a tape recorder and the electric was on. And she said to the three boys, would you like to sing into that? So we did. You ever heard yourself singing on a tape? 
Unless you're a good singer, it's brutal. And Elsie got us to sing, and uh, David, maybe keep me right, I think it was one by Donny Osmond called Paper Roses. If you find it in your hymn book, throw in the bin on the way out. <laughs> but I'll tell you what happened. Elsie played it back to my dad, and here's what she said to my dad. She says, Tommy, would the boys like to join the choir? And I went, not the choir, definitely not. And my dad said, yes, Elsie, they would love to join the choir. And choir practice was on Tuesday night. And Tuesday night was the Mournview Community Centre Youth Disco. I was first in last night. Never missed it. Never missed it. And when was choir practice? Tuesday night. I couldn't believe it. Off I went. The choir master, I don't think he ever smiled in his life. He just said to me, over here, son. And he gave me a frilly collar. And I put this frilly collar on. And I had long blonde hair in them days. I have a short back and shine now, but I had long blonde hair. And I thought, there's no way I'm dressing up like a girl. No way am I wearing this frilly collar. And he called my two brothers, David and Colin, over, and he gave them frilly collars. And he wasn't finished. He says, over here, son. And then he gave me a black frock. And I thought, there's no way am I marching up and down the aisle of any church on a Sunday morning dressed like this. And he wasn't finished. And he called me over to another locker and he pulled out a white smock. And there I was standing with a frilly collar, a black frock, and a white smock on me. And then he gave me this book and it had all musical notes in it. I could not have told you which way to hold it. Only I saw the writing at the top and I knew, I knew that's the top of it. I hadn't a clue. The Nuctaminus and all these and then the Amen, all this singing. And because I was the smallest in the junior choir, I had to lead every Sunday morning and evening the senior and the junior choir like this. And I could hear people saying, look at them, are they like little angels? <laughs> Fallen angels, let me tell you. If they only knew what I was doing during the week. But you know, Elsie eventually succeeded to get my dad out to church. She persevered. And I'm going to tell you something. There are folks from Lurgan here tonight. And you'll know this story. Tommy Martin, a drunken, violent man. A man who cared for no one but himself. He was getting ready one night. It was 1976. I'll never forget it. My brother David said, Dad, where are you going? And he said, Son, I'm going to a gospel tent mission. And the evangelist who has just passed away, Dick Saunders, was doing what is known as the Way to Life Crusade. And he was preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God with unusual power. And my father was getting ready and he went out to that tent mission and he came back home again. And I can tell you something, I knew there was something wrong with my dad. He usually would have beaten me. He would have then, then mentioned something I'd done maybe two months ago, which I'd already had a beating for, brought it all up again and then beat me again. He never said a word. In fact, he went straight up to bed, which was unusual. He never did that. He was afraid of the house fire, afraid of losing his life in a house fire. So he got his children to bed first. He put the fire guard on and switched all the electrics off and then went to bed. But this night, he did none of those things. He just went straight up to bed. And we sat baffled, the three of us, Colin, David, and myself. And then we heard his voice upstairs and he said, Lads, come up here, I want you. And we raced up the stairs and we jumped on his bed and sat there. And here's his words to us. He says, lads, your old man's got saved. You know, we didn't even know what that word meant. And David said, dad, does that mean there's going to be no more drink? And he said, son, that's right, no more drink. I want to tell you something. That was in 1976. My father passed away on February 25th, 1990. And not one drop of drink crossed his lips. The Bible tells me if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passing away. All things are becoming new. And God gave to my home a new dad. And David said one time to him, Dad, how did you change? And he said, Son, I haven't changed, but the Lord Jesus Christ has changed me. I haven't turned over a new leaf, son, but Christ has given me a new life. I couldn't deny the power of the gospel. To this day, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love my dad, a sinner, condemned unclean. But he loved him, and he died for him. And then in time, he saved my dad. And what a change. I could not deny the existence of God. You have to be there, friend, to see this. The grace of God is evidenced in the life of an individual. And I could see Christ in my dad's life. And guess what he did? He joined the choir. 
and he started to sing. And he entered into those missions and those meetings. And then he joined a little group called Hope United, whereby he worked with alcoholics. And my dad was going around giving his testimony and taking meetings, and we couldn't believe it. We heard him praying for his boys. But young as we were then, I knew that I was a sinner. I tell you, no one could have ever convinced me. I knew the things that I was doing, they were wrong, they were bad. And I knew in my heart, and I felt guilt. And when I saw my father, I felt even more guilt. And he started to witness to David, Colin, and myself. And my dad shared with us that we were sinners and that the Bible teaches there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My dad taught us the gospel from an early age and he told us how the Lord changed him. He told us what the Lord can do for us and he exhorted us as a father to a son to turn from our sin to repent of that sin and to come by faith to Christ. And my dad shared with us, as best as he knew how, three rebellious boys that he might see them saved. And my dad lived with terrible guilt for years up until his death, awful guilt for the way that he had treated his children. But you know, soon the Lord was to answer my dad's prayers. I'll just sort of fast forward here slightly because in around 1981, it was the height of the hunger strikes here in this province whenever there were 10 men who had died and starved themselves to death in the Mays prison. David and myself in particular had been frequenting some pubs and clubs from an early age, even from we were 14 years of age. And those people did not care two hoots about us. So long as they were able to uh, peddle their words to us and we were to give them the money, they didn't care. I remember celebrating my 18th birthday and you weren't allowed to drink in that pub until you are 18. I was celebrating my 18th birthday and they said to me, what's the happy occasion? I says, I'm 18 today. And I've been in that pub for most 14. And he just laughed and walked away. But you know, I can tell you now that the grace of God started to work in our hearts and lives. Uh, but not the way that I thought because the path that I took was different from many in this province, and yet it's not unlike to many in this province. Because my brother and I uh, were going to some house parties in Portadown. I could bring you to the very place, the very flat. And in those house parties, they were designed to recruit a lot of young men into the ranks of the paramilitaries. David and myself chasing sadly the things of this world, and alcohol and drugs and other things, and many other things. We got ourselves like a spider's web caught up in this spiral of evil and wickedness. And we felt we could not get out. Let me tell you something, friend. Sin entangles. Sin gets a hold and a grip on a person's life. And when you break certain barriers, there's a very high pr price to pay. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And the Bible tells me you reap what you sow. And I was sowing to the flesh, and I was soon to reap destruction. As a young teenager, I got myself in immersed, and I'm not going into details, with some of the paramilitary activity. The RUC, as they were new then, known then, they came to our house and they arrested David and myself, and they brought us along to Gough Barracks in County Armagh. To cut a long story short, we were interrogated over a three-day period. Then we were remanded in custody on a holding charge. They kept us there for 13 months. David was 18, and I was just 19 years of age. And there in Crumlin Road Prison, in that old Victorian-style prison house and jail, David and I were kept along with many other young men. They were all teenage boys, all from 16 to 19 years of age. A massive, massive amount, hundreds of young prisoners, only young men, only boys. And we're all incarcerated and remanded in custody to the Crumlin Road. And then sadly, our case took a turn from the worst because an individual who's incarcerated now at this present time in McGabry Prison, he turned supergrass. And that man implicated 27 other men in terrorist activity and crimes in the Mid-Ulster area between Portadown, Craigavon, and Lurgan and a few other places as well. So much so that there was high profile in our case. We were brought, I remember it, to the courthouse in Belfast after 13 long months in prison. And the supergrass retracted his evidence. Cut a long story short, those who had statements of admission were sentenced on their own statements. And as a result of that, I remember standing in the number one court in Belfast, and there were a couple of us, just a couple of us. And we were standing there, and we were the youngest prisoners in Northern Ireland at that stage. And I heard the judge say to me, I sentence you to 12 years in prison. 
He went on to give me a total of 27 years in jail. My brother David received a total of 39 years in prison. We couldn't believe it. I stood handcuffed to prison officers, surrounded by RUC men, and flanked. I'll never forget hearing the judge. I heard the cries in the public gallery of my father and my family members. I looked across before I was taken handcuffed down underground to see my dad and the tears streaming down his face as he heard that his two boys had been sentenced. It's an awful feeling, for I was taken from the courthouse, the Crumlin Road, if you know it at all. The courthouse is on one side, the prison house on the other. There's a tunnel that links the courthouse to the prison house. I was actually down that tunnel a few months ago. I was in the Crumlin Road giving my testimony to a group of men who were gathered. And I want to say this to you. I'll never forget that because I was only a teenager. I walked down handcuffed to a prison officer. It was a whitewashed tunnel. You could feel the icy chill. And as I walked down that tunnel, I was shaking. And then I was taken into a holding cell. It was just a little wooden compartment. You could not literally have moved your arms and spread them out. And when they closed the door, there was no light in that place. And I'll never forget it. You see, whenever I got saved, it reminded me of something. It reminded me of the sinner standing before Almighty God on the judgment day. And the Lord saying, I find you guilty, guilty of rejecting my son, spurning his offer of mercy in the gospel, guilty of not repenting of your sin and taking Christ as your Savior. And then comes that fearful, fateful sentence, not just 12 years, but everlasting punishment in hell, the place where God has forgotten to be gracious. Then you'll be taken hand and foot and cast in, not to a holding cell, but into the blackness of darkness forever. I had a little experience of that on the earth, and I understood the legal side of the gospel. I fully understood the guilt and the law, and in many ways God prepared me for the gospel of his redeeming grace by that experience. And I want to tell you this. My first recollection of prison was this. The officer said to me, we have nowhere to put you and your brother David and another young man that I have never mentioned his name ever in a pulpit and testimony. But I want to tell you, he was the youngest prisoner. David was the, 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 the second youngest and I was the third youngest prisoner in Northern Ireland at that time. And that young man that I've just talked to you about, I went to see him and witnessed to him recently. And last Friday night, that young man got saved and he has come to Christ. But you know, when we stood there, they said, there's nowhere we can place you. You cannot go down to the Mays prison because you need to be 21 years and over to go to that high security, maximum security jail. We cannot put you in Hyde Bank Young Offender Center because the stiffest sentence was four years, 11, and you young men are facing at least a minimum of six full years in jail on 50% remission. And so they did something to us that has never happened to any other prisoners. They kept us behind the wire, that's what it was called. And they kept us in solitary confinement for two weeks, and they still didn't know what to do. And then some official in the Northern Ireland office decided that he would have to put those three young boys down into the maze prison. Well, what a baptism into prison. The IRA had ended their hunger strike. They come off their blanket and dirty protest. They outnumbered loyalist prisoners three to one. They were beating them. They were scalding them with buckets of hot water. There was terrible turmoil in the prison as they were campaigning for segregation from Republicans and loyalists, and the Northern Ireland office refused it. And as a result of that, the loyalists then went on protest. And when I came into the Mays prison, immediately I was asked by the governor, are you willing to work with Republicans or do you want to go on protest? There was no choice. If I went into a Republican wing, that was my life over. And so I joined the protest for segregation and I spent perhaps a year and a half or so, uh, the worst time I've ever had 
in my entire life. But it was on that protest wing that God began to deal with me. Now, sometimes I was in solitary confinement for bad behavior. That means you were isolated from the prison population. You were placed in what is known as the boards because all you had was a wooden board coming out of the wall. That was your table. A little other board below it, that was your seat. You had concrete slab with boards over it and then boards shaped in a round shape. That was your pillow. You had no shoes, no belt, so you couldn't hang yourself, commit suicide. And you were left in there for hours on end, day after day, and you walked up and down like a caged animal. And the only thing that I had during that solitary confinement was a Gideon's Bible. That's all I had. Some prisoners, because the pages were very fine, they ripped it up and rolled cigarettes with it. But I was always taught that the Bible was the Word of God. And so I started to read the Bible. I started to read God's Word. And remarkably, I didn't know where to read. I didn't know what to read. But all of a sudden, God's Word began to speak to my heart. And all the things that my dad had said, all the things that I'd heard other Christians say, even in the prison, and officers who had witnessed to me, all the gospel tracts that I had read, all those little verses and all those choruses that I was singing in Sunday school and children's meetings, all of a sudden when I started to read the Bible, I began to see and hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I began to see portions and in Scripture that reminded me that I was a sinner. And certainly verses like Romans 3, 22 and 23, there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I knew very soon I would be back in the prison population again. I would be back on the protest wings again. And there'll be certain things that I'll be forced to do under the command structure of the paramilitaries. Cut a long story short, I immersed myself in the reading of the Bible. And I discovered there the story of God's love for sinners. I, I, I read those portions whereby the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, was sent into this world to die for sinners. And there's me. I know I'm a sinner. He died for me. He loved me. How can it be? How could he love me? It was a concept that I couldn't understand in jail. You couldn't love someone like me. Look what I've done. Look who I am. You couldn't love me. And yet the Bible tells me God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'll have to say this, men and women, that it was not a stiff prison sentence that changed my life. Neither was it a harsh prison regime whereby, and I'll tell you this, for 13 long months I was locked up Locked up for 23 hours every day. I had one hour exercise for 13 months. And when I was on protest for another 14 months, I was locked up 23 hours a day. Some 27 months, I was locked up 24 hours a day in a cell that was 8 feet by 13. And you shared that cell with two other individuals. It was horrendous. And therefore, solitary confinement was actually a blessing. And you're able to think. And I read God's word and I started to realize that Christ loved me. And I'm telling you this, that's what broke my heart. That's what changed my life. There were no circumstances, although God did use them. But it was whenever I realized that Christ died for me on the cross, that he loved me and he gave himself for me. And as one man told me, if I was the only sinner on God's earth, Christ would have come. Christ would have died for you. And that broke my heart. I lifted one night. I was sharing the cell with a man from East Belfast. We were on protest. I lifted a little booklet. It was by the evangelist Noel Grant. It was the 13th of June, 1983. Could I just pause and say something here, by the way? That there are some folks in this congregation, long before I perhaps got to know most of you, that I knew them. And those individuals came down from this congregation and they visited Christians in the Mays prison. And they wrote to us. They brought us food parcels from this congregation long before I was ever, or I was ever released from prison. And they visited with us, and I appreciate that. I want to set that on record tonight. I don't want to mention them. I can see them around the building here in case I miss one or two out. But I want to say on record that we were grateful for the fellowship, the prayers, the letters, and the help that you were to many of us in the Mays prison. But you know what I did? Lifted that little booklet. 
I started to read the gospel. And that little booklet started to explain that the Lord Jesus Christ was standing at the door knocking and seeking to come in. It explained in a very simple way how you can open your heart's door in repentance and then by faith you can invite Christ into your heart and he will forgive your sin, cleanse you in his blood, blood, and he will give you eternal life. And I remember just closing that little booklet and just praying what I felt was the prayer that I needed to say to the Lord. And I just told the Lord how sorry I was for my sin and asked him to come into my heart. I hardly had a Bible verse, but that night something happened to me. Christ kept his word, and Christ saved my soul. I'll never forget that man leaning. He was in the bottom bunk, and I was in the top bunk. And he said to me, and he called me by my nickname. I'm not going to tell you it. And then he says, here, are. do you want a cigarette? And he's me, no, no, I'm okay. And he bounced out of bed. And he says, you're going to become a Christian. I know it. You're reading that Bible and them little booklets. And you're going to church. I know it. You're going to become a Christian. And I just got saved. And I wanted to tell him, guess what, Jim? I've just become a Christian. And he asked me, no, I'm not. And I was so embarrassed. And he jumped back into bed again. And I felt so terrible. And then the devil got in and says, you couldn't be saved. Sure if you were, you can't even tell anybody. I didn't sleep that night, but I determined the next morning, the first thing I'm going to get up and tell this man. So I bounced up out of bed, got changed. And then just as I was about to tell him, the door opened and the officer opened the door and he ran out because he was an orderly and he had to serve breakfast and they slammed the door in my face and I stood there and I felt, Lord, I have to tell somebody. The door opened. It's called slopping out. I went up to the washroom. I finished all I needed to do, went to get shard, shaved and ready for nothing, by the way, just to spend the day in jail. <laughs> and I remember my brother David being at the sink. But the only time you would see him there once a week, he went there whether he needed washed or not. I remember him being there, and I just threw a bit of water around my face, and I looked at him, and I says, Dave, I got saved last night. And he says, you what? I says, I became a Christian last night. I gave my heart and my life to Christ last night, and I'm saved. And he says, have you told anybody? I says, no, you're the first one. David went down the wing and he started to tell every psychopath that was on protest. <laughs> My brother's become a, and guess what? Here's the danger though. Whenever you, people outside hear you're a Christian inside, the first visit you get is not from the local clergyman. It's from the R, you see. And they call you down, you get a police visit. That would put your life in jeopardy. And they're there and he says, oh, you're a Christian now. Maybe you would like to help us with some inquiries. <laughs> The police and I got on very well because I was in every weekend helping with their inquiries. That's a fact. And I says, well, I have nothing else to confess. And what I'm in for here is exactly what I have done. There's nothing else. But you know, I'll never forget it because some men that I feared, I have to say this, I feared them. They come up to me and they come into my cell after they heard. And they put their hand out. I'll never forget them shaking my hand. And here's what they said. And I mean this, I wish I had the courage to do what you have done. To stand here in a protest wing among UVF, UFF, Red Hand Commandos, UDA, and all the other factions of loyalist paramilitaries. To tell these men, I wish I had the courage to do what you had done. Well, if you'd only known how I was, shaking like a leaf. Seven weeks later, the 31st of July, 1983, I heard this mighty hallelujah out in the prison wing. And I raced out. I looked up to the top grill where the officers are and there was uh, the big cell. And I saw my brother David shaking hands with another uh, Christian inmate, believer, and told him that that night he had come to Christ. And David got saved and I got saved, seven weeks between us. But then came the challenge. The Lord spoke to David and to, to myself. You cannot serve God and mammon. Come ye apart, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And David and I knew what we had to do. And we called, I'll never forget that day. We called all the leaders of paramilitarism in the Mace prison into the cell. And they closed the door. And they says, we need to speak to you. And the first words were to us were, is someone bullying you? No. Nope. What's going on? Are you getting a hard time from anybody? No. What's wrong? We says, well, you know now that we're believers, we're Christians, we're born again, we're saved. Yes, we, we know that. He says, well, we can no longer remain under the command structure. We cannot be on protest. We cannot be breaking prison rules and regulations. And I have to say this to you. I stood that day and I thought, well, the least we can expect here is a severe beating. 
And then the prison officers will be told two men are lying in a cell. You better get them to hospital. So we expected that. That was the least I could expect from these men. And I didn't fear them. There's something in my heart they could never take away. And they could hurt me. And they could injure me. They could even kill my body. But the Bible tells me to fear God, who can kill both body and soul in hell. Let me tell you something. Those men did not touch us. Not one finger did they put upon us. I didn't know the verse in Scripture, but I know it now. If a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And that's exactly what happened. And those men begged us to stay, to be an influence among other men. But we says we can't because we'll be forced to do things that are contrary to the Word of God. And David and I separated along with other Christians. Cut a long story short, the Lord started to bless us and encourage us. And then people were getting saved, other prisoners. And then we started a fellowship in the, in the prison and we met in the cell and we met outside because we weren't allowed to congregate at times in the cell. We met in the prison yard. Men kicked football around us. They mocked, they blasphemed. They kicked the ball at us and we stood there. You were tested in your sanctification, believe me. But the Lord was good. I have to be careful what I say here because I met my wife when I was in prison. I said that in a meeting one time, and after the meeting, this dear old lady came up to my wife and says, what were you in for, love? <laughs> and my wife, was, my wife was absolutely horrified. And she says to me, Tom, don't you ever say you met me in prison. Just say that you were in prison and June came to visit. Well, that's exactly what happened. Uh, June started to uh, write to Christian prisoners. There was a lady called Florence Cobb. Florence Cobb's husband, Harry Cobb, was an inspector in the police in Lurgan. And the Republican movement shot him and killed him. And what happened was one of the men that did that was one of the hunger strikers, a man called Green. And Florence wrote, Carb wrote to him and said that she had forgiven him in her heart for murdering her husband. And of course, she was interested in that man's soul, that he might repent and turn to the Lord. But it created great interest in the newspapers the television and the radio, that a policeman's widow has now written to a hunger striker, a Republican terrorist, who had killed her husband. And of course, it created theological debate in the church. Can you forgive someone who doesn't repent? And therefore, as a result of that, those little group of Christians in the maze, all of a sudden, all of a sudden their profile was lifted. And then people started to write to us and correspond with us, visit with us. And then Florence came down and she visited with Christian prisoners. And she worked in the police station in Lisburn and my wife worked in Woodsides in the department store. And Florence knew June very well. And she said one day, would you like to write to a Christian prisoner? And she did that. She sent her just a few words away. And then I got the letter and another man. And he says, there's two girls have written to us. I says, which one has wrote to, written to you? And he says, this one. I says, well, who's that? I'd write to that one. And that's exactly how it happened. And then June came down to visit me. And a lot of people say, you know, those so-called professing Christians in the maze, they're just hypocrites, you know, and they're false professors. Well, that is true. There were some hypocrites, false professors, but you get it in the church as well. You get it in the church as well. But June came down and visited, and then uh, after two and a half years of going together in the maze prison, I only saw June two weeks in that two and a half years. She's only allowed a visit every so often. That's probably why the relationship lasted, you know. <laughs> and then whenever I got out in 1988, uh, June and I were married in June of that year. Uh, she's called June. She was uh, born on the 13th of June, and I was born again on the 13th of June, and we were married on the 18th of June. And uh, it's a very happy year, a month for us in the year. And I said to June, you know, I, when we got married, I says, I'm out after a 12-year sentence, and I'm now into a life sentence. <laughs> and that's what it's been. The Lord has graced us with three boys, and I do not desire silver or gold for my children. I desire one thing for my children, and that is they might know the Lord. They might walk with God. And I desire nothing else for my children. And I will work with all my heart to that end, that they might walk with God and know the Lord as their own and personal Savior. It was in 1988, that same year, I went down to Belfast to the Martyrs Memorial Church. Dr. Brian Green was the preacher. He preached on Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I felt the call of God to full-time service. 
I came forward with many other young people and I dedicated my body to Christ, no turning back. And the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. And I do believe that day I meant it with all my heart. I wanted to be sold out for Christ. I wanted to live for him. I wanted to serve him. And no matter what that meant and what cost that was, I was willing to pay that. And I know there are many other young people did the same and they're going on with God and they're in ministry today as well. The Lord directed me through his own word in Joshua chapter 1 to enter into the uh, Whitfield College of the Bible. I left school, by the way, when I was 15. I hadn't a single qualification. I really left when I was four in my heart, but I wasn't allowed to leave officially according to the law of the land. But I entered into Bible college and the Lord had seen me through uh, some very hard years in Bible college. I am from Lurgan and apparently Lurgan murders the English language. And then they threw in not only a refresher course in English language, I had to tell the Reverend Curran one day, you know what a refresher course means? You're being refreshed in what you already know, but I don't know any of that stuff. For I mustn't have been at school the day whenever they took that part in the grammar. And then he had to rethink the course in order to help some of us. And then on top of it, they threw in Greek. And then they threw in Hebrew. Unbelievable. I thought, I'll never get out of this place. You get out of the maze quicker. <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> But you know, the Lord has been good and he, he took me then into full-time service in Lisburn. And some 23 years ago, I was ordained, or 20 years ago, I was ordained. And I've been there from about 23 years now. And God has been good to me. I don't know why the Lord ever set his love on me. I just don't know why. I don't know why God was ever gracious to me. Why he ever saved me. Why did he save my dad? Because he's a God of love and mercy. God of infinite justice. He punishes sin upon the body of his dear son or upon the soul of the sinner in hell. My brother Colin, a year and a, half, year and a half before he passed away, came to Christ. He was saved. When my dad was in heaven, he saved himself. He's seen his eldest, middle, and youngest boy saved. What a wonderful thing it is. His prayers have been answered. I want to tell you a story before I quit. I was told whenever I was a child that my mother had passed away. And I believe that right up until about maybe 15 years ago when I discovered that my mother was actually alive. She wasn't in England as we thought. She was living 22 miles from my house. And David and myself, along with my brother Colin, some maybe 15, maybe more, I'm not sure how long ago it was. But we had the privilege of meeting up with our mother again. And she was only about four foot four or so. So I just wonder where I get my height from, but I know now. Uh, but sadly, she was just a drunken blaspheming individual, a woman who you could see sin written all over her face. Uh, she made a profession some 10 years previous, went on for six months, but didn't seem to be anything in it at all. And David and myself spent two years with my mum, telling her what the Lord had done for our soul. And then in Dundonald Hospital, we were perhaps maybe the last two, although maybe some of the other family were after us. And I remember saying before she died, Maureen, you need to come to Christ. Just call upon the name of the Lord. And the last words I spoke to my mother were Romans 10 and 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I don't know if she did, but maybe she did. Maybe I will see her in heaven. I don't know. But the Lord closed the chapter in my life and God has been gracious and merciful. In fact, I left the week of prayer in Kilkeel during the minister's time of prayer and with another minister on that Wednesday. I went to Roselawn Cemetery and I buried my mum and was able to witness to her, her family or other families she had and share the gospel. The Lord has been so good to me. I look back at my life and I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm undeserving, ill-deserving, hell-deserving. But here's the beauty of it all. The Lord Jesus Christ loved me and he gave his life for me on the cross. He shed his royal blood that I might be saved. And you know, tonight, friend, as I close, I can tell you that what the Lord has done for me, he can do for you in this meeting house. The Lord can save you. He can save my dad. He can save my brother, David, Colin, and myself. I can tell you, if he can do that with a dysfunctional home and a sinful and wicked home, what can he do with your life? If you will only come tonight to Christ, repent of your sin, and tell the Lord, and mean it, you're truly sorry for your sin. And turn from that sin. And forsake that sin. Separate from it. And come to Christ tonight. He's a wonderful Savior. 
He's a wonderful Lord. And he will save you tonight. He will forgive your sin. Listen to me. A lifetime of sin, he forgave me. And his blood can cleanse away a lifetime of sin. It can give you peace with God tonight. His work is finished. It's accomplished. Everything you need for heaven and home has been finished at the cross. All things are ready. All you've got to do, sinner, is come to Christ. Trust him. Believe on him. Confess your sin tonight. Invite him into your heart. Have you ever done that? Are you saved? Is it well with your soul? You are not here by chance tonight, for the Lord has you here because he has an interest in you. And he can save you tonight if you will come to him. But you've got to come. It's good you've come to the meeting, and we're glad to see you. But there's something more needed. You need to come to Christ, just as my dad did as an old sinner, just as I did as a prisoner, criminal, brought to Christ. We all came the same way. Oh, we might have come from different parts and different places and circumstances, but we all came the same way via the cross, through Christ, the only Savior. And if you'll come tonight, he will save you. He will save you now. God has spoken to you tonight. You're troubled about your soul. Well, you get that matter settled tonight. Don't go out of this house until you're saved. Don't be lost and taken up with the hype and the buzz that there will be afterward, the conversations, talking to people, meeting people. You just think of your soul tonight. You come to Christ, young person, older person, and you repent and take Christ as your Savior. And I trust tonight the Lord will bless that which has only been of himself and bring you savingly to the cross, the place where God punishes sin and pardons the guilty. Come, sinner, there's room at the cross for you. And Jesus says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, if ye hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Come, and what a welcome. May the Holy Spirit of God bring conviction to your heart and bring you savingly to the Lord Jesus Christ this evening. Let's bow briefly in prayer. Father, we do thank thee for those who have listened so intently this evening. We thank thee for the glorious gospel message. We thank thee for a wonderful Savior. We thank thee, O God, that Christ came, who is God blessed forevermore. He lived that sinlessly perfect life. He died an atoning death. We rejoice he is the end of the law for righteousness, having established righteousness for all who believe. We thank thee, O God, that sinners can be saved tonight. Their sins can be blotted out. They can have peace with God. And it's all because of Calvary, all because of the cross. Thank thee for the great love of God in the sending of the darling of his bosom, the only begotten and well-beloved Son. We thank thee that Christ died for sinners at Calvary. And if individuals will come tonight, we're glad that we can assure them on the strength of thine own promise and word that you will take them in and you will forgive their sin and you'll save them eternally. Do thine own work tonight. And while the voice of man grows cold and silent, and that which has been, O God of men, falls to the ground and dies, let thy word live on. Back at home, burn it in, and bless it to every heart. Father, save the lost tonight, and glorify thy Son. For we ask these things, giving thanks in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen.